Good morning and welcome to the third Smart Grid webinar on the subject of connection planning in smart grids. If you have followed us and our previous webinars, then you are familiar with us. But if it's your first time and you are new to Smart Grid, then we are an EU funded program under Horizon 2020. And our main goal is to provide learning packages for universities, the industry, and the public on the matter of smart grids and the power system in general. Today, I'm pleased to introduce you a panel of distinguished speakers and members of the project. And firstly, I would like to introduce an international expert on power converters and voltage regulation from the University of Ljubljana, Professor Borstjan Blažić. And our second speaker, a renowned authority on renewable energy integration and co-author of the book Smart Green, the central nervous system for power supply from the Berlin Institute of Technology, Professor Kai Strauss. My name is Karl Gui and I shall be moderating today's webinar. The format of the webinar allows you to ask questions. If you have them, please ask. If you have them, then please write them in the comment box and they will be addressed after presentations. And if we do not have enough time to answer all of them, then it's customary for our webinars to get back to you with those questions after the sessions via email or other forms of contact. And not to waste any more time, uh, here is our first topic, topic introduced by Professor Vlaric, Advanced Voltage Control in the Distribution Networks. Please, Professor, if you may. So, hi, uh, everybody. Hi, Carl. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to share my screen. Just a sec. Nothing happens, I can see. This is our classic um, webinar situation. Yes. <laughs> no worries, we have time. I just have some trouble with uh, allowing everything. <laughs> Too secure. I'm sorry, but I, it seems that I have to quit Zoom and restart again. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Let's do it again. Um, maybe we can take uh, Professor Strunz's topic before. Um, that is perhaps see, a good idea, yeah. And see if you can uh, make it back in time later on. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm sorry for this. No problem at all. Well. Uh, we get the other three today before, and uh, the topic um, on virtual power plants uh, introduced by Professor Kai Struntz. Um, Professor, uh, are you able to share your screen? Uh, oh, yes, lovely. I'm just trying to, is it coming up? We are seeing the upper menu of a uh, presentation. Okay. Now it's getting up. Is it... Do you see my screen now? L yes, this is perfect. Thank you. Oh, okay. So thank you very much, Carl, for the introduction. And uh, I'm happy to jump in 
um, in the meantime and introduce you first and foremost somewhat the module that we are planning and this is a, a good module we are actually just teaching it this week um, in combination and in cooperation with the university of, of ljubljana and we also taught it for the first time in berlin earlier this year so what is it about we would like to first talk a little bit about challenge and case-based modules and then go further into our module in particular so here are the modules being developed by the smart Greenet consortium first and foremost there is the topic area of artificial intelligence in the smart grid with consumers we have then the module of economic operation and societal challenges and then we come to the technical topic of connection planning in smart grids and here it's the University of Ljubljana and Technical University of Berlin that have taken the lead on this module that I would like to tell you about. So we first uh, start with lectures to introduce the students into the topic and then we complement those lectures with lab exercises because we think that um, such lab exercises are vital to deepen the knowledge acquired in the lectures and then we go a step further and round up with a project all in all we have six ects points that will be able to obtain by the students here are the topics within the larger topic area of connection planning and smart grid you see uh, it goes from general characteristics of distribution, demand characteristics, load and distribution forecasting, distributed generation, optimal control, electric vehicles. So we look into modern topics that are expected to define the distribution network in the future. And uh, two of those topics, the virtual power plant and the power quality, those we discuss now um, a little bit more deeper and uh, my turn is now the virtual power plant so i'm moving towards uh, another presentation that no, i prepared good dedicated to this topic of virtual power plant. I'm starting to share my screen and you, you should see it now. I share it and now I hope you see it. It's about service centric virtual power plants, Mark Renet webinar of today. So yes. I would like to introduce yes. you with the motivation of the topic, show you how we talk about the operation of the virtual power plant some conclusions and a reference that may be used uh, by for further reading so first and foremost what we need to know is that distributed energy resources are rather modest in size okay everybody knows that that's why they call distributed energy resources and as such they are often not able to bid into the market directly because of their reduced size and on the other hand uh, we know that curtailments are rising dramatically due to the over overloading of the distribution networks and in germany curtailments are particularly strong and uh, hampering the good usage of renewable energy generation uh, an aggregator could help addressing those issues uh, first the issue of market integration and second the issue of better dealing with congestion management and by providing dedicated services. And an aggregator, that's what its name says, groups and, co and coordinates various units of distributed energy resources. And as such, it is a manager of a pool and is able to control the diverse members of the pools as I will show you now in detail. So here we see potential members of the pools a wind farm uh, photovoltaic 
We have electric vehicles, batteries, and homes. And the service-centric aggregator, as we see it, has two main roles on behalf of the fool. R role one, it is uh, able to offering access to the energy market, even for smaller resources. And role number two, it helps with the congestion relief, which is a major, major problem for distribution system operators. So let's start with the role number one. The role number one, uh, as we see it, as providing access to the day ahead and intraday energy markets for the distributed resources. So what about the day ahead? So the day ahead is basically planning what we should do tomorrow. And you know, it is a quite a challenge to predict exactly the timetable for tomorrow. So how much wind we will have tomorrow, how much solar availability do we have tomorrow, what about the availability of electric vehicles. And therefore, our optimization will take into account the stochastic behavior. That's why we do a stochastic optimization uh, with the objective of minimizing operational costs. Once we reach the next day, we go into the so-called intraday operation. We have better visibility during the day. We can do an optimization based on deterministic information. And that helps us to minimize the remaining imbalance that we could not really foresee from the day ahead operation. Here is how the day ahead operation looks, because even in the day ahead operation, we strive to get as close as possible to the market closing. So here is how it looks. As you know, the market takes a little bit of time to process the bids and find uh, a merit order to, to, uh, to accept or refuse bids. So there is some time uh, that the market needs to process before the uh, actual implementation of the, of the scheduling. So we strive with the virtual power plant to go as close as possible to the market closing. So we send the bids here as close as possible so that we have the best information on the forecast available. And then we, 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 we schedule our resources for, uh, the, the, for the time that the market uh, accepts the schedules. But we also look beyond that, okay? Even though we may give the market results only for, let's say, a two or three hour or maybe four hour um, time slot, we also look what happens after that. That is necessary because in our scheduling, we also take into account storage. And we need to know when we should fill the storage and when we should use and, and deplete the storage. So therefore, while we look exactly into the market time frame, our scheduling thoughts always go further. And then we wait until the next possibility comes to send bids and we update then our forecasts and we will then always have the latest information. This approach is also called a rolling horizon approach because we are basically always using the latest information and then are able to adapt our schedules accordingly. So that's the role number one. The role number two is getting a solution for the network constraints. I'll show you here a medium voltage distribution network example. You see here photovoltaic, batteries, con con combined heat and power with the thermal storage, more photovoltaic, more batteries, more wind farms, and more photovoltaics. So that's how we expect that to be. It's part of a secret benchmark model uh, where we found this uh, network information. So now we have our aggregator and the virtual power plant basically has an aggregating function and the aggregator here has access to, to its customers. Yeah? And the customers also includes loads. It includes a pool of different resources. 
However, what we need to know, the aggregator has no access to the grid itself. Okay, there is a clear definition of the roles uh, that the aggregator has access to the resources like photovoltaic, wind, and whoever are its customers, maybe also electric vehicles, household, but not access to the power grid itself. I mean, to the lines, to the transformers, to the switching states. That's the role of the distribution system operator. And the aggregator may have also customers in other parts of the network. Of course, we only show here a certain network section. So here is a flowchart of how we can imagine that congestion relief to happen. First of all, the aggregator does its schedule. Okay, we talked about the scheduling earlier. The scheduling is done on behalf of the members of the, of the pool. And uh, it's basically part of this ruling horizon optimization in the intraday. Once the schedules are completed, the aggregator sends its schedules to the DSO. That's the distribution system operator. The distribution system operator checks whether it, the schedules give a feasible solution. That means whether the network is congested or not. The DSO therefore does a power flow calculation for all branches and the DSO checks whether the power flows calculated are below a maximum allowed okay we don't want to overload the the uh, network branches if if there is no overload then it's good but if there is an overload so if the condition is not met then we need to look further so here here is this part first the aggregator makes the schedules, we see it here, it does the schedules by uh, corresponding with its members acting on behalf of their wishes. It acts because the aggregator sees its resources as customers. Now, the, it sends the schedules to the DSO and the DSO, as said, makes the power flow calculation for a check and then the DSO notices, oh, at 9.15 in the morning, we have a congestion on the branch 3.2. You see it here, it's, it's shown in red. From 3.2.2 upstream, we have a congestion and the congestion is 0 0.8 megawatts too much. So something needs to be done about. And that's not a, not a rare type of congestion. If we have a lot of renewable energy available, for example, if there is good wind and solar potential, then what can happen is that we have congestion because a lot of power is trying to flow upstream um, to the other parts of the grid. So what can we do now? Well, the first thing what we should do is, and that is the role of the distribution system operator, we try to reconfigure the network. So is there a way we can change the switch states of our network in order to avoid the congestion. So that's being done now. For example, here we have a switch. Do you see the switch S1? And the S1, why don't we try to close the switch S1? The switch S1 is open now. We can try to close it and see what happens. And now indeed the power can flow over the switch S1 and go upstream here. However, now uh, we see that we have solved the congestion between three and two, but we get a new congestion here. Branches from 14 to 13, from 13 to 12. We create a new overload, so that doesn't help us really further. We can try more switches, but um, if there are all possibilities exploited, then that means we cannot go further. So, um, what now? What can we do now? Well, we can try to get help from the aggregator or the virtual power plant. So to do so, the, the DSO who has the information of the network and the buses, and he knows the impedances of the network, he calculates what needs to be done to relieve the congestion. 
And for doing that, it knows what are the impedances of the network and so it can calculate so-called sensitivities. It can calculate how much percentage the generation at a certain bus needs to be modified in order to relieve the congestion. And it will convey this information to the aggregator and the aggregator can now try to see whether it is able to delivering a service and change its generation portfolio um, in order to relieve the congestion. So here is how it works. The DSO notices that we have here 0.8 megawatt too much, meaning we need to change the power flow by minus 0 0.8 megawatt. So we need to reduce the flow by 0 0.8 megawatt. Now remember, we have a lot of solar and wind in feed, especially here solar, here we have wind, and that's trying to go upstream. So why can't we actually reduce here the solar impact? So what happens sometimes is that today, the DSO forces the resources to do so. But here with the VPP, with the aggregator, we try to do it by cooperation. Because as we know, the VPP, the virtual power plant, owns a pool of resources. So it owns also storage. So why not increasing a little bit here, for example, our storage fill in, in order to solve the problem. So, but the virtual power plant of course needs to know by how much uh, service is needed. So here, the 91%, that information coming from the grid operator tells that 91% of the power injected here will actually flow on the line between three and two. And 90% of the power injected into the bus number eight will also flow from three to two. So not everything that is injected here will actually arrive on the line. So we will actually need to reduce our power here by more than 800 kilowatt. So by more than 0 0.8 megawatt in order to have an effect. More strictly speaking, it would be 0 0.8 megawatt divided by 0 0.91. If we do that, then we achieve the effect desired. So what now happens is, the virtual power plant will use this information on the sensitivities and do an internal rescheduling and new optimization, taking into account the needs of its consumers, but also taking into account the request by the distribution system operator. For that request, of course, it will get a payment if it follows that service, and that payment can again be used for the benefits of the, of the members of the virtual power plant. So the solution by cooperation is very useful. So now the aggregator does the rescheduling and sends the new improved schedule to the DSO again. The DSO will now do a verification. And now the verification shows that indeed now we have relieved the congestion. We are able, because we used internal storage here, um, that can be used later again. Uh, but now, for now, that storage has helped uh, relieving the congestion on the line. So this is basically a cooperative way between different members uh, to reduce the congestion. So in our lab in Berlin, this is here a photographic impression of our lab in Berlin. Um, actually, students are here and we have lectures like Smart Greenet where we can show to the students on the screen how the action of such a virtual power plant can happen. Here, for example, we see a picture of the German power grid, especially the Eastern German area, the transmission lines. And if we zoom in here, we see Berlin. So we see here the subsection of Berlin. If we zoom in further, we see our university premises. So here we are in our university lab and we can even see how the power 
would flow into our university lab ring that you see here. So there is a direct interaction between uh, what the students can see and, 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 and the, the teaching I told you earlier uh, in my introduction that we like to do lab components at SmartGreenet. We also get help from the project WindNote, which is a German project that help us facilitating doing this um, simulation of the German grid. Uh, also, uh, originally our virtual power plant research uh, was also done in a European grid and part of it has been implemented in Evora in Portugal through the European Union project sustainable. So we really bring here, that's the message, into Smart Greenet modules, the latest research results, the latest um, ideas of how to manage the smart, the smart grid of the future. So concluding the concept of service centric virtual power plant is very forward looking. It integrates cooperation between distribution system operator and VPP to first and foremost support the market integration of distributed energy resources that otherwise would be too small and now get the opportunity to participate with the virtual power plant as the, as the participant. We increase the share of renewable power generation, which is very, very important by making good use of the different diverse resources that we have. And we can contribute to secure system operation by avoiding congestion. So, and if you would like to have further detailed uh, knowledge about that service-centric virtual power plant, we have written it up in a, in a publication that is uh, displayed here, where you may use for the keywords and look and read further. And with that, Carl and Bostian, uh, I would like to inform you that this concludes my part of the talk. Of course, um, any question will be welcome, but that's up to our host, Carl Kohl, to see how he would like to manage question and answer sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I, have, I do not see any questions from the audience at this very moment, but we have people in our room listening in. And one question arose, um, taking into consideration that um, VPPs are being, um, um, as you yourself, showed used by the industry and and um, customers with high consumption or production and there was a question regarding households um, that should new real estate projects like housing projects or high rises uh, already start planning um, coordinated congestion man management technologies into new buildings for the future and, and what, what might be the cost for a household to integrate uh, this technology to provide services uh, for the grid? Such was the question from, uh, from the audience here. Well, the, the, um, the, um, what, what would be needed would be basically uh, the household would have to have some flexibility. Mm -hmm. And it would basically need to be able to participate on what we refer to as demand side management. Okay, mm -hmm. so you need to have something like a smart meter and the smart meter gateway that allows you to communicate your needs and uh, towards the virtual power plant. Um, so you need to have some sort of flexibility in your generation or, um, or, or consumption, okay? Because if you don't offer flexibility, there is not something that the VPP can really, can really work with, okay? It mm -hmm. can help participating in the market, but it cannot help with congestion management if, every, if the status quo is unchanged, okay? But if you say, okay, you are willing to adapt your, um, 
adapt your generation or your consumption according to a certain agreed plan with the VPP, then that is good. So it's basically the same type of requirement as participating in demand side management. Okay, the, the virtual power plant just helps with making the demand side management more efficient in, in the sense that it can act on a behalf of a pool and can also uh, arbitrary, make an arbitrage with the interest of the grid operator. That's basically it. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, from Eric Tamsalo, is there any direct communication between TSOs and DSOs regarding VPP aggregation? Uh, for example, if VPP provides provides intraday services to the TSO, does TSO get any information about the event? Well, yeah, I, it's it's a very 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 good question. First and foremost, uh, the DSO and the and the VPP of course need to communicate. Uh, that that's for sure. Uh, otherwise, they cannot, uh, uh, you know, agree on a certain schedule. And it was shown. That, uh, that there is a communication. And in the paper that I added at the end of the talk, uh, the communication uh, is actually detailed at which moment, which communication would take place. Um, you know, here I only gave the big picture. Uh, regarding the TSO level, yes, and that's part of our research that we're performing right now, okay, moving, to cooperation between the DSO and the virtual power plant to also include the TSO, so the transmission system operator network. And this uh, uh, is something that uh, we are finishing in terms of research, also in cooperation with other uh, network operators here in Germany. And uh, however, it's not yet included in the smart green net module because the research work is still ongoing. As soon as that finished, we'll see how, it, how we bring it to the classes tour. Thank you very much. And, and the last question, if, if, if we may, Professor. VPPs control the power sources, correct, through the smart meter. But is there a need, for, is, is there a need to install any other proprietary devices in addition to the smart meters? Well, I'd, I'd ideally not, okay, ideally not. And actually, uh, smart meters are, in my, my opinion, also a topic of, of itself, okay? We are right now running a parallel project, um, which is not finished yet, so I don't have the final results yet, where we actually make a survey of all the different smart meters and smart meters gateways available and what they are and how flexible they are in the application and, and what kind of uh, flexibility they have. So it's very hard to say here smart meter is exactly this, okay, because they are very different smart meters with different capabilities. But uh, as uh, Alex Gabriel said, ideally, Ideally, it would not be necessary to install proprietary devices, but technology is so fast evolving and so that I cannot give a precise answer because there are many different smart meters available. So it's really a matter of implementation. What we have shown here was more like a general concept uh, and, and, and that, that uh, has gained a lot of traction for the implementation we really need to take uh, uh, look into those very intelligent questions uh, that uh, Mr. Gabriel has posed. Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if we may move on, as time is, um, uh, it's not against us, but it's not with us as well. Um, uh, Professor uh, Blasic, uh, are you ready? <laughs> I, I hope I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also hope that you are. Um, please, uh, at your own time.
Hello. So, anything happened? Um, we can still see you. Yeah, that's great. Oh, now it's loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, so you see my presentation screen, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry again, and I apologize for this. I had to set some permissions, but to go to the topic, um, uh, as you have heard uh, in the first presentation, uh, well, there, there are basically, let's say, two limitations or two constraints when we are talking about distribution network operation. The first one was uh, discussed in the first presentation. Uh, so it's about uh, power flow, let's say, limitations. And the second one will be the main topic of my presentation, so is uh, voltage, so voltage limitations. And we will talk, of course, about uh, advanced voltage control in uh, distribution networks. So, okay. What is, the, uh, what is the main uh, challenge? What is the main problem? You are well aware of power system challenges, challenges, so the challenges in the today's power system. The fourth one, of course, is the integration of renewables. As you know, we are integrating more and more renewables. Uh, if you have a look at the graph on the right-hand side, you can see that, let's say, in the, in the last years, or, well, last years, in the last two decades, especially the share of, let's say, of uh, uh, PV, uh, wind, wind power generation, and also biomass and renewable waste generation is increasing. Well, you can see at the top here that the share of hydropower uh, plants generation is more or less steady. So we are not building uh, uh, substantial, uh, uh, substantial new uh, hydropower plants. But as I have mentioned, we have other renewables uh, with the installed power rapidly increasing. And what is the impact uh, of renewables which are connected to the distribution network level? Uh, one of the first impacts we are seeing and also one of the first limiting factors uh, for the proliferation of uh, distributed generation is the voltage increase. So uh, distributed generators connected at distribution level uh, uh, cause a voltage increase. Of course, there are other effects like increased power fluctuations. The uh, re renewables have also an impact on electricity prices and so on. But today we are mainly focusing on uh, voltages. Uh, the second uh, of the challenges and also an important one are the new loads uh, in the power system. So by new loads, I mean especially uh, heat pumps uh, and the other one are electric vehicles. So we are seeing a rising uh, number of heat pumps used for clearly for heating and electric vehicles uh, uh, in, in, the, in the power system. And of course, both, both type of loads are connected to the distribution level. And clearly this is not, let's say, a small change for the distribution network operation because we are talking about, let's say, the electrification of heating and el electrification of transport. And energy-wise, these are very large sectors which are being now uh, transferred from uh, traditional, let's say, uh, uh, carbon fossil fuels uh, to the uh, electricity energy. So we are, we are seeing a transition of two sectors, so heat and transportation to the electri electricity sector, which is clearly a big, uh, big change for the, for the whole power systems. And in terms of voltage, why are the EVs and heat pumps a challenge? Uh, when, uh, well, to put it, uh, let's say simply, uh, when we are connecting EVs or heat pumps to the distribution level, the first obstacle, the first uh, constraint we, are, we usually encounter is the uh, overloading of uh, power system elements. Usually the first uh, element that is overloaded is the uh, tra transformer from the medium to low voltage. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and after this, the second problem, problem we are seeing are the low voltages. So connection of new loads like heat pumps and electrical vehicles, which are fairly, let's say, uh, large loads, uh, uh, is, is uh, so the cost, uh, they cause low voltages in the, in the distribution network. So in terms of voltages, you have actually uh, two then disrupting factors. The, the first is the connection of uh, renewables, which causes uh, an increase of voltages and the connection of new loads like heat pumps and electric vehicles which cause a decrease of voltages. Uh, here you can see some equations, so it's really a simple case to illustrate, illustrate, uh, illustrate the drop uh, of voltage and uh, the increase of voltage. So we have a medium to low voltage transformer 
a power line on the low voltage uh, uh, level, uh, different loads connected to it, and two distributed generators, so two renewable sources connected uh, to the line. And here you can see on the graph with the voltages, you can see uh, two curves. The, the light one, this one, uh, shows the voltage drop towards the end of the line when we have only uh, consumption and no generation. The other one, so the black one, shows how the voltage goes up towards the end of the line uh, if we have a substantial share of generation uh, on, on this line. Uh, if you just have a brief look at this situation, uh, equation here on the right side, so you have just two voltages here. The UR is the receiving end voltage. So this is the voltage when the customer is connected. US is the sending end voltage. So let's say this is on the network side. Uh, and you can see if you forget about the reactive power, if you, uh, if you focus only the, on the active power, so you have one, uh, one here and one here, if the active power is, is positive, so we usually use positive for loads, then the, uh, the voltage uh, on the consumer side will be lower than the voltage on the, uh, on the network side. So clearly we have a voltage drop on the line. If this is negative, so if you have generation uh, connected to this node, to, connected to the uh, user side, then the voltage on the user side will be higher than the voltage on the network side. Uh, and clearly uh, this can be a problem, of course, if the voltage is uh, too high. Uh, as you may know, the voltage limits as indicated here in this uh, voltage graph, uh, according to the power quality standard, which is used in Europe, are set to 10% above the nominal value and 10% uh, below the nominal value. So the voltages for the users at the user connection point should, should be between these two limits. Uh, otherwise, uh, the devices we are connected to the network may have problems. And usually in the case of distributed generation, if the voltage gets, gets above 10% uh, above the uh, nominal value, so above 110%, then the uh, distributed generator, generator is uh, disconnected. Okay, so what solutions do we have? We, uh, we will look at the traditional approach and then uh, to the, let's say, advanced approach. So what is the traditional uh, approach to voltage control in distribution networks? So usually the today's uh, distribution networks are a poorly observable and poorly controllable system. What does this mean? Uh, this, this means that there are not uh, a lot of measurements uh, at distribution level. And basically this means that the uh, distribution system operator is not aware of the condi conditions in the distribution grid. This is especially true, let's say, for the low voltage part uh, of the network. So for the low voltage pet network, where there are usually uh, no measurements uh, or the measurements uh, uh, or the number of measurements is, is very low. Clearly a lot of house, households have smart meters, but these are usually uh, uh, used only for uh, metering purposes. So for, uh, for billing and not for, let's say, uh, uh, observe the network state in the uh, in the low voltage level in the low voltage network, and the second term. So we have a, pu a poorly controllable system. It means that there are no not many let's say devices which can be controlled by the distribution system operator. In a traditional distribution network, the only controllable element is usually the transformer. So trans transformer uh, which connects the high voltage side and the medium voltage side. Uh, this transformer is equipped with a tap changer and with this, this tap changer you're able to control the voltage in the whole distribution network. This is a very, let's say, simple and straightforward control. This tap changes measures the voltage here at the secondary bus bars and adjusts this uh, uh, voltage according to reference value. So it's very simple uh, and if you, let's say, increase the voltage uh, with this transformer, the voltage in the whole network is increased if you decrease the voltage with this transformer, the voltage with the whole network in the whole network is, is decreased. So it's a very, let's say, uh, simple way of controlling the voltage. Uh, and what do you do uh, if you have a poorly observable system? So you, if you don't have much data, let's say, on how, uh, what is going on actually in your, uh, in your system, if you don't have the measurements. Well, of course, you have to, uh, you have to make the distribution network robust enough that uh, can with, withstand uh, all possible operating condition. This means that no, no matter what the user does, the, uh, the voltages will be okay. And this is, let's say, 
the main uh, way of uh, uh, distribution network planning which we're having today we usually call it the, the this, uh, traditional let's say way of planning a distribution network uh, and it's done by by means of voltage band allocation so let's say you start with a reference uh, voltage which you are you are controlling with the transformer so this is the voltage let's say the transformer is trying to to keep with the operation of the tap changer you have the uh, hysteresis because uh, the tap changer is not let's say able to keep exactly the set voltage and then you allocate uh, bands for uh, for different uh, voltage levels you for, for example say okay the maximum voltage drop i allow in the medium voltage network is five percent then the maximum voltage i allow on the medium to low voltage transformer is two percent and so on the maximum voltage i allow the maximum voltage drop i allow in the low voltage network it's eight 0.5%. And this is at maximum loading. What do you do if, uh, let's say, you exceed, I don't know, you exceed the 5% at medium voltage level? Well, you, you simply say, okay, the loading is increasing, the, uh, the loading is increasing, uh, the voltage drop it get, is getting too high, uh, we have to reinforce the network. The same on the low voltage level. If this, let's say, voltage drop uh, goes uh, uh, above the 8.5%, uh, of course, this is the only one case, you do the same, you reinforce the network. And of course, you uh, take into account the, uh, the worst operating conditions. One of the worst operating conditions is also that the load is zero. This means this is the upper curve, the blue one. So the blue, uh, the blue curve here, I'm, I'm showing here on the graph. Uh, if there is no load in the network, then the, the uh, voltage uh, at the customer connection point will be more or less the same as the voltage here uh, at the transformer. And you have only this space, so 2.5% allowed for the, the connection of distributed generation. So this is the voltage increase, which is allowed in this network uh, in order to not, not to break the uh, upper limit, limit, which is set at 1.1 per unit or 10% above the, the, nominal, the nominal value. So this is, let's say, a fairly simple approach. And well, actually we have to say that it worked uh, very well until now. Uh, the problem with uh, the new uh, devices we're having in the network, so with, with the renewables, with the heat pumps, with electric vehicles and so on, is that this approach uh, will or would result uh, in a very high uh, overdimensioning of the network. So to keep this approach, uh, we would have to, let's say, uh, seriously reinforce the network. And this, of course, comes uh, at the price. That's why we are um, looking at some other ways to uh, increase the hosting capacity of the network. So the hosting capacity means the capacity uh, of the network to accommodate, let's say, renewables or heat pumps or electric vehicles. Uh, without the uh, without the requirement to uh, substantially let's say uh, increase the the size of the transformers the cross section of the power lines so without the need to excessively uh, uh, reinforce the power network and of course uh, that's when the advanced distribution network uh, voltage control uh, comes into play uh, um, here I'm illustrating just, let's say, some concepts or some basic examples of advanced voltage control. One, let's say, relatively straightforward one is advanced voltage control with the existing uh, tap changing transformer. So the, what is the advance here? So instead of measuring the voltage only here in one network point, you can measure the network, the network voltage in multiple points, so in multiple network points. And in this way, uh, you, can, uh, you can control the voltage mar much more precisely. And of course, uh, you have much more freedom, let's say, uh, on how to set the voltage. The other, let's say, okay, a more expensive solution uh, is to uh, install also at this level. So uh, at the transformer station from the medium voltage to low voltage, also here you can install uh, transformers with a tape changer. So, and this gives you, of course, a much increased flexibility at low voltage level. The third option, which is often used, uh, is that distributed generators, which are connected to low voltage or medium voltage level, control the voltage by means of reactive power. So a distributed generation generator 
measures the voltage uh, at its connection point and controls uh, this voltage by means of uh, reactive power. So this is why uh, I'm, I'm, I'm this noting here as the uh, reactive power as a function of the voltage at the connection point. Uh, this is a requirement in many uh, networks today, so at many distribution network operators. So the distribution generators are required uh, to control the voltage by means of uh, reactive power control. And the last option I'm mentioning here, a bit more advanced perhaps, is voltage control as a service provided by customers. So also a customer, uh, so a household consumer, can provide uh, a voltage control by means of uh, demand response. So by means of adjusting his or her consumption according to the voltage at the connection point. How you can uh, adjust the consumption? Perhaps you don't charge your car where the voltage uh, in the network is too low. This is, this is let's say, a very uh, simple, uh, simple one. Uh, and of course, when you have different elements which enable voltage control in a network, you can, you can coordinate them. And this uh, 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 leads you to the coordinated voltage control. Here is just, let's say, a brief example. I will not go into the details, but ju just to illustrate you the concept of how this works. So you are, let's say, uh, having uh, multiple controllable elements. Uh, let's say you have a, a, a a transformer with a tap changer, which is able to control the voltage. You have distributed generators, which are able to control the voltage by means of reactive power. And of course, what you want to do, you want to control the voltage in your network uh, with a minimum, minimum injection of reactive power. So you, will, you would like to inject uh, the minimum uh, amount of reactive power, which is needed to control the voltage, uh, to maintain the voltage within the uh, required limits. So you set the optimization function, which minimizes the reactive power. Here in the, the, the second two rows, you set the operational limits. Clearly, it, each distributed generator, generator has a limit regarding uh, reactive power generation. And these two equations just so show you, uh, just help you to calculate what is the impact of the uh, reactive power change. Uh, uh, on a voltage in a particular uh, network node. Uh, you heard about this uh, in the presentation before from Professor Strunz. So it's the so-called uh, sensitivity matrix. This is, let's say, this one. And this sensitivity matrix gives you, let's say, the information uh, on uh, how much will the injection of reactive power in node one affect the voltage in node two. So, and by using uh, these equations, you are able to, uh, to activate, let's say, the di distributed generators, which will have the most impact on the problematic uh, network node. And in this way, you can, let's say, optimize the required uh, reactive power generation to maintain the voltages within the uh, defined limits. Okay, if I said before that we are, uh, let's say today, st still seeing a pretty traditional uh, way of uh, planning a network. So what is the, let's say, more advanced uh, way to plan the network? Uh, usually some, let's say, some statistical uh, tools are needed. So a stochastic approach is usually needed to, let's say, to plan a modern power network. Why? Uh, with, net, with network planning, of course, we are assessing or trying to assess some uh, future operating conditions. And what are the challenges we are facing? What is the variability of the uh, network conditions in, in the future? Of course, there is a high variability in the, uh, let's say, in the loads. So the variability at distribution level is uh, quite high, much higher than the va variability at the uh, transmission level, for example. Then you have the distributed generator generation, so renewable sources which are connected to the grid. And of course, the generation from renewable sources is also very variable depending, of course, on the, on the weather, wind, uh, so insulation, and so on. Uh, moreover, let's say you are able to assess that there will be more uh, distributed generators in a particular network in the, in the future, but you, you don't know the locations. It's the same for EVs or heat pumps. You can assume that there will be some EVs or some heat pumps in a particular network, but you don't know the, uh, the locations. Clearly, you don't know uh, who is going to buy an electric vehicle in a certain low voltage network in the next, let's say, 10 or five years. 
Uh, well, the traditional approach would be to, to, to uh, assume the worst case scenarios. And this will result in a very expensive network. The, uh, let's say, more advanced approach is to use stochastic uh, modeling. Let me briefly exp explain this. Let's say in the stochastic modeling approach, uh, you uh, evaluate uh, every, let's say, distributed generation, the generator or load or heat pump, or electric vehicle with some probability curves. Let's say in this case, this case just shows the probability curves uh, for, uh, for uh, power distribution on a secondary substation transformer. Uh, and let's say you can see if you take only one graph at a particular time, let's say this is uh, in the evening around uh, 6 or 7 p.m., you can see that there is a very low probability that the power will be 35 kilowatts, but it may happen. There is a high probability that the power at this hour will be somewhere here. So let's say between 30 kilowatts and 20 kilowatts. And it's also very uh, low probability that the power will, will be uh, around 15 kilowatts or, or below. And you operate, you calculate all your voltages and so on with these probability curves. What you get as a result, I'm showing only one result. Uh, of course, if you use probability curves as the input, you, you get probability curves also as an output. And this is, let's say, the probability of a, a loading of a medium to low voltage transformer. If you again take a look, let's say, an evening hour around uh, six or seven in the evening, you, you, you can see that the results will be that the, sour, that the power uh, through this transformer will be somewhere, uh, somewhere here. So somewhere between, let's say, 90 kilowatts and somewhere in between uh, 200 kilowatts. And clearly, the most probable results are here in between. And this is the results uh, you can use uh, also for uh, clearly for network planning. Uh, for the end, I will show you just uh, some results. Let's say again uh, um, a case. Let's say we were we were de dealing with, and this is uh, the uh, hosting cap capacity of a low voltage network in case of distributed generation, and you again obtain the hosting capacity. Let's say. Uh, as a pro uh, in terms of probability curves. And here are, let's say, the results. Uh, the hosting capacity means uh, simply how much distributed generation can you connect to a network uh, without going into, into uh, problems with um, uh, voltage levels. And let's say you take the same network and you use the classic or conservative network planning when you observe, let's say, the worst case scenarios in this, uh, in this case, you will get the result that, let's say, the amount of DG you can connect to this network is 115 kilowatts. So uh, 115 kilowatts of DG can be connected to this network without violating the voltage limits. If you use the probabilistic approach, let's say, this means that you uh, take into account, of course, that not all the, uh, let's say, distributed generate generators uh, generate the maximum power at the same time to take into account that there is always some load, so based on the data, uh, and that it never happens that the load is zero and so on, you can increase this hosting capacity uh, to 117%. So basically, this comes for free. You, you just uh, change the methodology. You, did, make, you did, did not make any investments in the network. If you further on assume, let's say, that the uh, distributed generators uh, contribute to voltage control by means of uh, reactive power control, you can increase this uh, amount of uh, DG, so install DG to 205 uh, kilowatts. So as you can see, different approaches uh, enable to uh, increase the, the hosting capacity uh, without the need to reinforce the network. And that is the, the main message. So uh, there are ways uh, to, um, to connect uh, distributed generation or, uh, or electric vehicles or heat pumps to the network uh, without the, the necess necessity to reinforce the network. Okay, and to briefly conclude, uh, we are facing, as you know, uh, different challenges, quite big in, in the at distribution level, connected to renewables and also the connection of uh, heat pumps and electric vehicles to the network. And you, you have basically, in terms of voltage profile, so adequate voltage profile, you have two, 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 let's say, solutions to this one. So one is the network reinforcement, which is, let's say, a so-called classic solution, which comes at a price. 
And the second one is uh, advanced voltage control. Uh, and you do basically the advanced uh, voltage control by uh, first by uh, ensuring a higher, uh, a better network observability. So more measurements in the network. And the second step is better network controllability. So more controllable elements in the network. And of course, these two, let's say, approaches, so the reinforcement and uh, advanced voltage control do not exclude each other, so they can be uh, combined. But any case, uh, in any case, if you use advanced, advanced voltage control, let's say you will need less investments uh, in the network, uh, which can be quite substantial. So thank you. And that was it from um, my side. And I guess I'm ready for some questions. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. We do have a question in. It, um, re it regards the realization of this approach. Would there be a local controller at the high voltage, medium voltage substation independently, or would this approach be solved in a centralized approach? Where would the, where would the uh, control action be located at? Yeah, okay, so in terms of voltage control, uh, as you could see, you have different solutions. And we go to the, from the simple ones, in simple, in terms that are easy to implement to the more complex ones. Uh, let's say uh, if we are talking about uh, the voltage control with the high voltage to medium voltage transformer, this is a very simple one. Nowadays, it uses only one measurement uh, at the connection point, point of the transformer. If you have more measurements in the network, which okay, uh, a lot of distribution companies are, are installing more and more measurements. These measurements are, are they trans, uh, transferred to the control center and uh, they, are, they can be used also by the transformer controller. So you need measurements from the network, you need, let's say, an advanced transformer controller, and this is, and then you can control the voltage uh, with the measurements in multiple points. This is also pretty straightforward to implement. Uh, we were talking also about the uh, voltage control by means of reactive power from uh, uh, distributed generators. This is also done at the local level. So you have a PV plant, which measures anyway the voltage at the connection point, and uh, it has to be able uh, to generate reactive power based on this voltage. And this is also what nowadays power plants do. So this does not require any, uh, let's say, uh, communication between the power plant and the uh, distrib distribution network control center. And of course, the upgrade of this, the so-called, let's say, coordinated uh, voltage control would, uh, would require to coordinate all these elements. So to control the tap changing transformer, to coordinate the uh, voltage control from distributed generation, and this, yes, this would require a more advanced, let's say, uh, setup. This means that all these elements have to be controlled, have to be connected by means of communications, that uh, all these data uh, have to come to, let's say, a distribution uh, network control center, and there has to be a control algorithm, uh, an optimizer, let's say, in the uh, distribution network control center, which then uh, coordinates uh, all the controllable devices. So different steps and uh, different, uh, let's say, levels of complexity. Um, an additional follow-up question was asked, how much would the communication late, uh, latencies or missing measurement data affect this approach? Uh, both, uh, both questions are a problem in distribution networks because let's say uh, the, the measurements usually are not so reliable. Okay, measurements plus communication, the whole combo, they're not so uh, reliable. Uh, usually, uh, this problem is usually solved by, by the use of state estimators, which, is, which are also, let's say, used more and more often also distribution level. The goal of, uh, let's say, uh, of the state estimator, state estimator is an algorithm uh, which is running at the distribution uh, network operator, so in the control center, which enables to calculate uh, the voltages in, in all network nodes uh, based on the measurements you have. And it allows also to, let's say, exclude the measurements which the algorithm fi finds as erroneous, so which have errors. So there are ways to exclude also uh, erroneous measurements. Uh, so the, the ones that will, let's say, connect uh, poor, uh, uh, poor uh, let's say, performance of the voltage control algorithm. 
but indeed, let's say the, the connection problems uh, with measurement devices and so on, latency, are a problem at distribution level. Okay. One of the, one of the last questions, where does the motivation for the consumer or the provider come from in this uh, control model? So the consumer, so, okay. If we are having uh, a distributed generate, generator, which is required to control the voltage by means of uh, a reactive power, well, this is simply a requirement. So if you want to connect your distributed generator to the network, you have to provide uh, voltage control by means of reactive power. So this is, let's say, a brute force approach. So you require something. Uh, in case, let's say, uh, um, let's say a household user uh, would like to participate in voltage control by means of demand response. So let's say I will charge my car, I don't know, uh, at midnight instead of seven, uh, seven o'clock in the evening because at seven o'clock in the evening the voltages are too low, then probably there, there will have to be an incentive. So uh, for me, let's say, uh, for me as a user, household user, uh, to adjust my consumption, heat pumps, uh, uh, electric vehicles, whatever, uh, I will need to be incentivized. So I will sell my, let's say, demand response as a ser service uh, to the distribution system operator, and he will pay me for my service. Okay, it's, not, it's usually not done directly to the distribution system operator, but through an aggregator. So uh, aggregator aggregates a, a pool of uh, users, and it offers uh, demand response to the DSO, distribution system operator. And of course, uh, he, gets, he gets paid for this service and also the users providing this service get paid. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'll just give an ad additional food for thought. A probability of opening up the reactive power market isn't actually um, um, fantasy anymore. We have opened up the active power market. Why not look into opening up the reactive power market and see if we can even um, provide this solution um, an ec economic side which doesn't even have to imply incentives. Maybe the market will regulate itself. I mean, who knows what will happen in five years time. Professor uh, Blažić, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Strunz, thank you very much. We went seven minutes over, but the discussion or the questions were very good and the presentations were excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening in and uh, look forward to new um, news from SmartGrenet. Maybe we'll have another webinar, who knows. And uh, stay safe during this uh, uh, turmoil uh, period of COVID, which we are having. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.